am very lucky. I have this rather lovely gift, which I really appreciate every day. And my gift is that I can work out what's wrong with someone in three or four minutes. And usually, I can cure them in five minutes. And because it's quite a talent, I mean, I'm very lucky I got it. I'm always being asked to go on the radio and go on TV, and people ring up with their problems, and it's like, you've got to do your magic, you've got to cure them in five minutes. If it takes half an hour, it's not the same. So one day, I'm on this radio show, and this woman's rung up, and she is having such an anxiety attack. I can't even hear what she's saying. She's kind of going, <gasps> So I'm like, okay, I've got five minutes to sort this girl out. It's going to take me 20 to get her to breathe properly. So I'm like, okay. I've got to do this cheesy thing, but I've got, so I've got five minutes. I'm listen, just, just relax. Just imagine you're walking along the beach and the sand is in your toes and the waves are lapping. And she cut me right off and went, I can't do that. The beach is not available to somebody like me. And I'm a bit confused now. And she went, oh, yeah, well, you're English. You don't understand. I live in a trailer in Nebraska. I'm nearly 60 years old. I don't have any money. And she said it again, I have never been to the beach. It is not available to someone like me, and I'll probably never go. And I'm like, wow, if that was me, I would be taking three buses once in my life. I'm going to have the sand in my toes. I mean, I live in a country where turquoise water and sun was not available, but I do make a point of finding it. So, you know, she was a great gift to me because I remember thinking, how many people have that belief? It was quite early in my career. And a couple of weeks later, I'm working with this, well, I call him a squillionaire. This guy's got so much money. He owns swathes of London. He's a property mogul, and he's a chronic, chronic alcoholic. And doctors always, always send me people they can't fix, like we can't fix him, send him to Marissa. We can't do anything with him. See what you can do. So in he came. And he said what all my clients say, I've been to rehab, I've done all of this, I just can't stop drinking, the cure is not available to me. And I'm like, you know, that isn't true. So I do something very different. I put people in hypnosis and I count them back and I say to them, when I count to three, you'll be back at the scene that has caused you to drink. And they always go back to it. And I like to do three scenes because it's like being a detective. You take the scenes and you kind of put them together then you explain to the client, sometimes they explain to me, they do my job for me. Oh, yeah, I now I see that's happened, but now that's why. So I've got this guy in hypnosis, and I said, okay, we're going to go back to why you drink. So I counted to three, where are you? And he said, I'm six years old. What are you feeling? He said, no one loves me. Not a person in the world loves me. Okay. Obviously, I'm speeding this up for you. Now we've gone to another scene. Where are you now? He said, I'm seven years old. And he said, and my parents, they don't even like me. I don't understand. I have no one that loves me. And the next scene was pretty much the same. Where are you? Seven. What's going on? I don't understand why my parents hate me. There's nobody in the world that loves me. Okay. So now I'm daisy-chaining this together and going, okay. So tell me now about the love in your life. And he went, well, I don't have any. He said, love is a bit of a foreign country to me. It's just alien. I've never had love. I have friends. I have staff. I have millions of pounds, but I don't have love. And um, I'm 66 years old, and I guess I never have love. And I'm like, and do you know why you drink? He said, no. I'm like, because that is so painful. When you're six, you can go, I don't understand. My mum and dad don't love me, but... Maybe I'll try really hard and I'll be smart and cute and kind and clever and they'll love me. And of course it doesn't work because it's not the six-year-old's fault. And then they get to, oh, right, I've tried all this stuff. They don't love me because I'm not lovable. And once you buy into that, that's a real problem because you go through the world with this belief. And I want you to remember this expression, first you make your beliefs and then your beliefs make you. So be very careful about the beliefs you make because they make you. And once you've made a belief, guess what happens? You go out into the world and the universe matches your belief. So you believe, oh, dogs are vicious and bite you. Well, they pick up the energy and guess what? They are vicious and bite you. You believe, oh, dogs are wonderful. They're so loyal. They're your best friend. You could, when you leave here, decide, okay, I'm going to go out in the world and believe that people are dishonest and rip you off and are rude. 
And you will find that everywhere you go. And the next day you can wake up and think, I'm going to believe that everyone is kind of basically kind and good and will help me out. And guess what? You will find that too. And the problem is that we form beliefs and we've been on the planet for five years, six years. I'm not lovable. Love isn't available. Success isn't available. Money isn't available. Even health or happiness or believing I matter or I count, that's not available to me. So I talked to him and said, um, okay, so I'm getting your reasoning. Love wasn't available and now it's not available, but you didn't appear to own swathes of London when you were six years old. You didn't inherit this empire. You went out and got it. Why don't you go out and get love? And he went, but I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, how do you know how to go out and buy all this land and all these hotels and all these apartments? So eventually I got him to understand that it was just a belief. And I said, do you know why you're an alcoholic? Because it's so painful to say, I'm not lovable. Better to go, I'm not lovable because I'm an alcoholic. I don't have love because I'm an alcoholic. That's easier than saying, I'm not lovable. So this is what my clients tell me. Love isn't available. Relationships aren't available. Wealth isn't available. Success, health, happiness, praise feeling I'm significant, believing I matter. Even compliments are not available. But the biggest one, the one that's on top of all the ones that should be on there, we'll fix it in the interval, is love. When you believe that love isn't available, it's very painful. And Diana was actually a fascinating girl to work with because her mother left when she was four. She was pretty much raised by nannies and then sent to boarding school. And she had a very interesting belief love isn't available. I can find love, but I can't keep it. And because I've got so many amazing clients, you know, limos turn up at my house, bodyguards turn up at my house. I was standing in my neighbor's garden and the other went, oh, I think that's for you. And this big limo came down my street and out got four bodyguards and two stood at the gate and one stood at my front door, one came in the house and out came this movie star. My neighbors always go, I don't understand why these people come. They've got everything. I'm like, yeah, except they don't feel lovable. So people think that fame damages people. Actually, I found the other way around. Damaged people want to be famous. So let's imagine there's someone standing here. They do, because you a little kid going, my parents don't love me. I don't have parents. I'm like a foster child or a stepchild. This isn't fair. How can I find love? And they go, I know. I'll become rich and famous and everyone will love me. So they go over here and suddenly they're rich and famous and they go, yeah, but you know what? They love this body. They love this talent. They love this voice. They don't really love me. And now they're screwed because when they were over there, they said, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to be loved. And I'm over here and I don't feel any different than I felt before. I still feel unlovable. And now I've got nowhere to go except down. And everyone knows about it. And that's when a lot of my clients start to implode because the drive to be famous is because they never felt lovable. And when they get fame, they still feel unlovable. So Diana did what a lot of people do. She gave what she wanted to give. Do you know the percentage of nurses that come from dysfunctional families is astonishing. It really is a calling. They give what they most want to get back. Not all of them, of course, but a huge proportion. And Diana could make everyone love her. She was magnetic, she was charming, but she never, ever believed that she was worthy of love. And the only person who wasn't captivated and madly in love with Diana was Diana. She didn't think she was lovable. And Marilyn Monroe was very interesting. Someone asked me the day if I worked with her. I'm like, no, I'm really not old enough to have worked with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> but nevertheless, I know an awful lot about Marilyn Monroe because she was a classic example. She was born and she was fostered immediately. Her, her parents didn't want her. Mother gave her up. Father didn't want to know. And she went into the foster system. And when she was two and a half, she lived with a foster mother who had her own child, also two and a half. And of course, her own son would go, mama, mama, mama. And Marilyn started to go, mama, mama, mama. And the foster mother went, no, 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 you mustn't call me mama. I'm not your mama. You can call me auntie. 
And every time they went to a park or a playground, Marilyn would go, there's a mama, there's a mama, there's a mama. Because she knew she didn't have one. She felt completely different. And she kind of was already forming this belief that she was never going to have the love that other people had. And she went through life with an interesting belief that love is available for a little while because she would get a bit of love in the foster care, then she'd get moved. And when she married Arthur Miller, she was planning her divorce on the day she got married to him because of her belief that I'm not really lovable, I can get it, I can't keep it. And her shrink had said to her one day, you know, Marilyn, what is going on with, you know, I've just seen this footage of you dancing in front of all these GIs, you're sewn into this dress, everything's falling out, and you have no underwear on. What is that about? And I'm going to quote what she said word for word. She said, I need everyone to love me. I must belong to the whole world because I have never belonged to anyone or anything in my whole life, and I fear that I never, ever will. And that is a word for word quote. I need the whole world to love me. I must belong. I've never belonged to anyone or anything. And that is the real problem with feeling unlovable, that you kind of pick it up and then it kind of radiates out from you and people pick up your beliefs. So I was asked to work with Amy Winehouse and I really wanted to work with her. She was quite a fascinating girl and in preparation for my working with her, I read up a lot about her. I already knew Amy is an alcoholic, Amy is a drug addict, Amy is anorexic and bulimic veers between the two. Amy has depression, and Amy is addicted to really damaged men that are going to bring her down. And she didn't turn up for any appointment, and I only ever spoke to her on the phone. And I said to her, why didn't you turn up? And she said, what's the point? I'm damaged beyond repair. Forgive me if I swear. She said, I'm complete. You can't help me. No one can help me. And the problem with Amy is that she did go into rehab and get clean many times, and she could give up drugs, and she could give up alcohol, and she could, for periods, stop being anorexic, but she could not give up this belief that being normal was not available to her. And you know, she never wrote a happy song. She wrote, Back to Black. My tears dry on their own. Love is a losing game. If you listen to those lyrics, it's so tragic. That even being loved, I'm going to lose at love. And then she wrote, I told you I'm trouble, you know I'm no good. And she really believed that. And if you listen to Back to Black, she's talking to her boyfriend and she says, you know, you go back to your old girlfriend, you go back to normality, and me, I go back to black. I go back to darkness. I go back to depression. I go back to being so abnormal and there's nothing normal available. And I know that it was that belief that killed her. It wasn't drugs. It was the belief that normality is not available. Of course, beyond that belief is the real belief, I'm not lovable. And see, Whitney Houston, she was the same. When she was 16 or 17, her record label pushed her as this God-fearing, deeply religious, pure, wholesome girl that was okay, but she was already a drug addict, and she was already being told, you must not let anyone know your real sexuality. Hide that, you know, pretend you're madly in love with Bobby Brown, and live a lie. And she did, and it was so abnormal. And she too had this belief, normality, that's not available to me. And then her poor little daughter was brought up in a house where normality was not available. So I'm going to talk to you today about your beliefs, and I want you to think about what you think is not available to you. Who here, be brave, I'm not going to embarrass anyone, it's not my thing, who here might just have a belief that real, wonderful, lasting love is not available to them? Put your hand up. Who here might have a belief that being really, really successful and keeping that success going is not available to them? Who believes that money, making money, keeping money, not available? Who believes that knowing they are deeply significant, they really matter, they're here for a purpose, they have an extraordinary gift? Who thinks, no, that's not available to me? Okay. And who here might believe that even being healthy 
isn't available to them. So, you know, someone told you this. No one comes into the world, a baby is born, and the first two experiences, everyone looks at them, the doctor, the nurses, the midwives. They go, oh, don't look at me. I'm a bit fat today, my stomach sticks out. <laughs> Babies love being looked at. And if you take your baby home and shut it in a cupboard, what's going to happen? It will scream for days, because its belief is, someone's going to come and look after me, because I'm so cool. All my needs are met in the womb, so they're going to move out of the womb, and people are going to take care of me, because I'm lovable. And then someone, somewhere, tells you the opposite. And you've got to think, who is that person? What do they know? You know, even doctors tell you, see, whatever you tell your mind, it will believe. So let me do something with you. I want you to just put your arms out in front of you as if you're holding like reins or the handlebars of a bike. Just put out your hands and close your eyes. And I want you to imagine, to tell yourself that in your left hand you are holding an enormous red fire bucket. And it's filled with 60 pounds of sand and it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. So in your left arm you're holding a bucket of sand and it is so heavy you can feel the weight right up into your shoulder. You can feel it in your elbow. You can feel it in your wrist. Your left arm is getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And the harder you try to keep your left arm up, the heavier it's becoming. And in your right arm, you're holding a huge helium-filled balloon, a big blue balloon. It's bigger than you, full of helium, completely weightless. And now your right arm is floating and moving and pulling and lifting and traveling up. And the harder you try to push that right arm down, the more it feels as if you are trying to push a balloon underwater. It just insists on springing up, lifting up, traveling up, getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And all the time, your left arm is getting heavier and heavier. And the harder you try to lift up your left arm, the more it feels like it's been encased in concrete. And the harder you try to push your right arm down, the more it feels like it's attached to a pulley that is pulling it up. And just notice, one arm is weighed down, one arm is weightless, because of a belief I just gave you. It's a belief. So keep your arms where they are, open your eyes, and look around the room. You see, beliefs are real. Beliefs are things. So let's do another one really quickly. Thank you. I want you... Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want you to react to thoughts, and we don't upgrade our thoughts enough. And time and time again, I go back to people who come up with beliefs they made. We've been on the planet for five years. They made a belief, I'm not good enough. There's never going to be enough money. I'm not pretty or handsome or smart or strong. No one's interested in me. And we keep those beliefs for no other reason than they're familiar. So I sat in a doctor's office, um, and I want you to imagine you're holding in your arms you. You, the day you've just been born. You're this beautiful, perfect, brand new baby. You just came out of a womb where everything was available 24 hours a day. You got food, you got heat. It was always 75 degrees in there. All your needs were met. And you'd just been born. And I want you to think, that little child who's just been born, what should be available to that child is masses and masses of love. But you know, that's often not the case. My mom told me that when she had me, she was really upset because I was supposed to be someone else's baby, my dad's best friend, as it happened. And years later, when I was doing hypnosis, I felt that. I felt that disappointment. But it didn't matter because that was just the beginning. That's not my life. So I want you to imagine you've got this little baby in your arms. And I want you to think, what do you want to be available to that child? Do you want love to be available? Of course. What did you want 
the person holding you as a newborn to say. And I'm going to tell you, and you're going to repeat it out loud, and I want to hear you. I want you to say to that little baby, wow, look at you. Wow, look at you. Repeat it. Wow, look at you. You are the most perfect thing in the world. You're so beautiful. You're so gorgeous. You are completely lovable. And when you grow up, you're going to find so much love. Because love is available to you. And it always will be. Success is available to you. You matter. You're significant. You have a gift. And you're meant to be here. And keep 